On the evening of the 23rd of September, 1983, the Texan oil city of Kilgore was rocked by the brutal mass murder of five people following a robbery at a fast food restaurant. It would soon become famously known as the KFC murders, a crime that would remain an unsolved mystery for more than 20 years until advances in DNA technology seemingly cracked the case. But were there right men caught? Or is there a final twist in the form of police corruption? You decide. Before I get on with today's true crime video, I want to say thank you to my amazing sponsor, HelloFresh, which I adore because we use them, which means I'm getting sponsored to do a video by people that I already use. That's how much I love this product. The thing about HelloFresh is, first of all, it means that you get inventive. I literally am one of those people who cooks five meals and then I can't think of any others. But because of HelloFresh, I've kind of picked up loads of different cooking skills. So I have a miles bigger repertoire when it comes down to the kind of food that I give my family, which is delicious, obviously. But also the other thing is I'm really short of time in my life. I know the majority of us out there are like, I have no time at all, which is why this is great because you can make meals in 20 minutes. I go for those constantly because I have so much to do. I just want to make sure that cooking is something I can fit in, but also I don't waste anything. I am one of those people who's really guilty when I shop and I'm not thinking about what I'm going to cook. I just end up throwing it away at the end of the week thinking, would have been nice to have put something together and created an incredible meal for my family, but instead I'm just literally throwing my money in the bin. But of course, the big question that you have right now is what are you gonna be cooking today? Well, let me tell you, I'm gonna be cooking pea and onion marmalade linguine, and it's only gonna take me 20 minutes. Although for you, it's gonna be substantially faster. Check it out. Now this video would not be complete without my beautiful assistant who can come and tell me what amazing cookery skills I have. Take it away, sir. Yeah. I will expect marks out of 10. Yeah? <laughs> mm, yeah, yeah. <laughs> mm. 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 Definitely a 10. Is it definitely a 10? It is. It's a 10. It's really nice, actually. Basically, Nigella, you better be worried about your position. In fact, to any of those cooks out there, they want to be worried because I've got HelloFresh and that means that I am a contender in this field now. Currently, I've got the most awesome offer with HelloFresh for you guys. So if you follow the link, you will get not only 50% off your first box, you'll get 35% off the next three after that. Just put in the code 50 Emma Kenny. So if you happen to have a husband and family who eat you out of your house and home, mm -hmm. HelloFresh will make it interesting for them to do so. Make sure that you take advantage of this awesome deal. Now, on with the true crime video. From cooking to crime. Seamless link. Welcome back, my loveliest to True Crime with me, Emma Kenny. If you're new to this channel, I release my content on a Wednesday and a Sunday. So if you like a bit of crime and consistency in your life, this is the channel for you. Get your notifications on, subscribe, get involved in a live premiere, leave me a comment, a like, ask me a question, do any of those things. Thanks to my Patreon subs. Guys, I'm putting more podcasts out there all the time, but your contribution makes a big difference to my life. Same with my YouTube membership. You guys have no idea how you've transformed my opportunity to make great content, and I will always be in your debt. For those of you who cannot afford to help me out, please just understand that every single view you bring me, every comment you connect with me, every like, you make a difference, you really do. So never put yourselves out when you can't afford it. Everything is about a community here and I appreciate all of you. Let's get on with today's case. And it's one that you asked me for and it's one I hadn't heard of. So thank you for recommending it, but wow, it is shocking. 
Now, anyone who's come to this channel is interested in true crime and murder forms a great deal of true crime commentary. But murder itself is actually, thankfully, a really rare occurrence. So in a typical year, only six people per 100,000 are victims of homicide. That's six too many obviously, but it kind of gives you some perspective on how rare murder is. Now, men make up almost 80% of homicide victims. They are far more likely to be murdered than women. But that said, it's around 90% of murders are committed by male perpetrators. So it's men killing men on the whole. Often these killings are gang related. And that means that the types of murders that we hear about are often very alien to many of us. We don't associate with the reality that it could ever happen to us because we literally don't move in their circles. It's why when we hear about murders that don't fit those paradigms, it's utterly, utterly blindsiding because you think, wow, that could happen to me. Because sometimes murder happens during the course of regular everyday life. You know, those moments where everything just feels utterly normal. There's nothing unremarkable. You're just going about your business. And then all of a sudden the unthinkable happens, which is exactly what happens in Kilgore, Texas in September, 1983. It's Friday, the 23rd of September in 1983. It's around 9 p.m. in the evening. And Star Spagano walked into Kentucky Fried Chicken in Kilgore, and it, that's on the main north-south route through the city. She's with a boyfriend at the time. And as you do, you're looking around, you're checking out who's in there when you're in the restaurant, because you have a period of time to wait, don't you? And as she goes in, she notices a white van that's parked at the rear of the building, and it's near a dumpster. And for whatever reason, in that moment, even though this is just a normal trip to KFC, she just remembered thinking there's something a little bit strange because it was parked where there were no parking spaces. And then later when she's in the line, just ready to order her food, bear in mind at that kind of a point, I'm more interested in what I can eat than looking around. But this is why I am probably one of those individuals that something could take place in front of me and I just wouldn't notice because I'd be like, I'm sorry, I was just wanting my plant burger. But she is really very good at observation and she's kind of looking around and then she's listening. And she overhears this telephone conversation between KFC employee Kim Tyler and her mother. That was the KFC assistant manager, Mary Tyler. Now, Kim told Mary that the afternoon deposit hadn't been made. And she states at this point that there's over $2,000 in the register because it had been a really exceptionally busy evening. There'd been this really big football game on in town. There were loads of customers and the money needed taking to the bank. Now, what really stuck with Star was the fact that she heard this conversation and it's unusual that you hear people talking about money in that situation and also indicating that that money needs to be shifted from one place to another or of course that there is accessible funds available to people who have a malevolent interest in that. And Star says that while she was listening to that conversation, and it obviously made her feel a little bit uncomfortable because she notices that there are two young men behind her and that they are also listening in. She noted that these were two young black men and she later gave description of the men immediately behind her to the police. So Star has really taken this in. She then sits down with her boyfriend, they eat the food. She watches as the two men eat their food. Then she watches them leave and walk towards the back of the restaurant. But for whatever reason, she actually checked on whether the white van left, but she didn't see it. She didn't see it go anywhere. So shortly before closing time, Star and her boyfriend have now finished eating. They leave KFC and she notices that indeed, as she had suspected, the white van was still there. Later on that very same evening, it gets to closing time. Now, there are still three employees in the restaurant at this time. We've got a 37-year-old assistant manager and mother of three, Mary Tyler. We have 39-year-old mother, Opie Hughes, and 20-year-old Joey Johnson. 
Now also in the restaurant at the time were 19 year olds, David Maxwell and Monty Landers. And David and Monty were friends of Joey's. They were all in the same Kilgore College fraternity. So they were obviously having the time of their lives in a fraternity, attending university. You can imagine at 19 years of age that their life was absolutely just beginning. They would have had so much potential because they were clearly doing everything right. They were upstanding citizens. They were obviously academic and you just can imagine the paths that their lives would take. Now, David actually worked at the same KFC but he hadn't been working that night. And the reason that he had turned up was because he had a motorcycle, but he'd lost his keys to it. And unfortunately that meant he couldn't get around. So Joey, who was obviously lovely, and again, testament to these young men's friendship and consideration and compassion, Joey had allowed David to use his motorbike. So David had then driven to KFC on Joey's bike to basically give him a lift back. So we've got Mary Tyler, Opie Ann Hughes, David Maxwell, Joey Johnson, and Monty Landers at that point in KFC. Now, I'll be honest with you. The research that I've done right from the get-go, I'm gonna tell you I cannot tell you for certain what happened next, but I'll tell you what it is believed happened next. The belief is that two armed people enter the restaurant through the rear door and they go in there with an intention to rob the place. Shortly after they actually get in to the restaurant, a struggle ensues, and this actually results in a large dent in a wall, and there is large amounts of Mary's blood that's on the floor and in the office. So it's evident at this point that we can grasp that there was a violent robbery taking place. And the way that they have theorised this initial part of the crime played out is that Mary was probably hitting either the mouth or the nose at the scene and obviously that can cause a great deal of blood loss. But that's not where this story ends, that we're dealing with a violent robbery because the perpetrators are literally only getting started right now. So they've gone in, they've been very violent to Mary she's bleeding. They managed to take the money from the cash register. They also take the bank deposit bags. And that was at a point where you would imagine they had done an armed robbery and it's time to get out, right? That's what happens in armed robberies. You go in, you get the money, you get the hell out of there. But that's not how this is going to end. Things are far from over. Now, around the same time that this robbery is taking place, a man by the name of Bobby Robinson is basically driving by KFC. And he noticed that only lights in the back of the restaurant were on. He also noticed that there was a light colored van parked at the back door and he noticed that that van was open, but he didn't actually see anyone in the restaurant or the van but there was just something that really caught his attention about that. We also have another witness. Now she's called Linda Hardy. She also remembers seeing a light colored van and it was parked near the back of the restaurant, but she noticed that it was in the drive-through lane facing the wrong way. So it stood out. Now it's believed at this point, the robbers forced the three employees and the two friends into the white van at gunpoint. And then they drive off into the night. Another potential witness, a guy called James Rowe, he sees a white Ford Econoline van around the same time. And it's important to note that he didn't actually observe any African American men in it. In fact, according to him, in the van, he saw a white man driving, that this guy had long black hair, it was a long black shaggy beard as well. And he said that he noticed he was wearing a woolly cap. Although it's also worth saying that it could actually have been a mask pushed back on his head. As the van drives from the rear of KFC, that van nearly collides with him. And he claims that he saw three people in KFC uniforms hollering and screaming in the van. Now I'm gonna throw it out there, guys, right from the get-go, that if I saw a van 
driving away at speed to a point where they almost collide with my car and I see three people in KFC uniforms hollering and screaming in it. I'm going to be following that van, taking the number plate down, then calling the police. And I appreciate mobile technology was not available in the way it is today, but there were certain opportunities to get the number plate, go and knock on somebody's door and be like, I think I've just seen a potential kidnap take place of KFC workers in a van. And I think it's probably bad because they were hollering and screaming. Bizarrely though, he didn't report it for a year. A year. So I'm gonna throw it out there, even though that account was given, it's difficult to know how reliable that is if it took him a year to report it. But what we do know is that those robbers drove the captives approximately 15 miles. Imagine how terrifying that would be for them. Bear in mind, we've all heard about armed robberies, but kidnapping is very unusual. I can't imagine what would be going through all of their minds in that moment. Why are they being driven? Is it so that these guys can create some distance between the robbery site itself and them having the opportunity to go and report it? Is it to confuse them? Is it just another part of the game to scare them? Or is it that they want them dead? All of those thoughts would be rushing through each of those kidnapped victims' minds. They get to an overgrown oil field. This is on County Road 232. They believe that at this point, they were all forced at gunpoint to go into the field. They then made them lie on the ground, face down. There is another witness a woman called Marsha Williams. She actually lived next to the oil field. She said that just before 11 p.m., she actually saw a van with just parking lights on pull into her driveway and it stopped there for a minute or so, but then it drove away. But about 10 minutes after that, she heard what she thought sounded like rapid gunshots. Then five minutes later, she heard one final shot. Now, I will note that when I looked at this area, it would not be uncommon to hear gunshots in it, but it is relatively strange to hear them outside of hunting season, and it was outside of hunting season. But it's understandable that this witness who heard it wasn't too perturbed by it. It wasn't something that she'd heard before, but it just rang, shall we say, a small alarm that it was in quick succession that those shots went off. When KFC assistant manager Mary Tyler didn't come home as usual. You will automatically appreciate that her husband was really worried. She had a routine because at the end of the day, they expect her back at a certain time. It's their normal ritual. So her daughter then drives to KFC and she's instantly scared. She's really concerned. The back doors are open and what she notices immediately is there's blood on the floor, no one's there. And the cash register's open and emptied. So she knows straight away that her mother has either been taken by someone or is seriously injured somewhere. And it is without doubt a robbery that's occurred. So she immediately notifies the police and she reports Mary and her colleagues missing. The officers do get there really quickly and they take a look around. They're trying to figure out how the crime has played out. And the actual dining area itself, well, it looks pretty undisturbed, but they do notice that there is a sign of a disturbance elsewhere. In fact, they find a pool of blood 12 inches in diameter on the floor behind the serving counter. They also see drops of blood in the back office. And they notice that two cash registers are open and of course empty. They then start looking for the missing KFC employees. They also have to inform the families of those missing people of their disappearance. And none of us can imagine what a visit of the police to inform us that somebody that we love has potentially been abducted or even worse, to be given that information. 
I can't imagine how you would respond and react. The helplessness, the hopelessness, the lack of control. But that's what each of those individuals had to listen to when the police informed them of their family being in risk and danger. It's obvious to the police that a robbery has taken place and they believe that the robbers had indeed entered through the back door. And it was likely that they'd managed to gain entry when one of the employees was emptying the rubbish into the dumpster at the rear of the building, because that makes sense. That's what the employees will be doing, particularly at the end of the night. And they noticed that one rubbish bag was in the dumpster, but others were still by the open back door. The cash registry tape, well, that indicated that about $2,000 had been in the cash box. They also found that whilst the robbery had been taking place, the perpetrators had actually rummaged through the shelves beneath the main cash register. The area was really messy, it was disorganised, and officers found that a cardboard box that had once had rolls of register tape in it had blood all over it. Investigators also found a bloody napkin from the back work area of the KFC. Unfortunately, as many of you know, who are true crime experts, I would call you most of the time, DNA back in the 90s just wasn't anywhere near as advanced as where we are now. So unfortunately, in spite of the fact that they had that blood, it wasn't enough to obtain any profiles. That technology literally wouldn't be available for another decade. So understandably, the police immediately are very concerned about the employees and they believe that all three have been abducted. Of course, what they're not aware of at this moment in time is that there are two more people missing. It gets to midnight, just around midnight, and suddenly a young pregnant woman arrives at the restaurant. This is just so heartbreaking. And that young pregnant woman was 18 year old Lana Maxwell. She was David Maxwell's wife. They'd been married literally for less than a year and she was pregnant, she was having his child. She told police that she and David had been driving to KFC earlier that night around 10 p.m. on his friend's motorbike because they were gonna pick him up. But David realized that, not being strange, it's going to be a little difficult to fit you, me, and my friend on the bike, especially as you are carrying my child. So what he'd done then is he'd turned back dropped her home and then he'd set off again to collect Joey. But he'd never returned home. So now the police realise they have five people missing. And to some degree, you can imagine that to the police that might seem like a better outcome. You know, if there's five of them, why would they take five of them to do harm to them? That's a lot of people, that's a lot of bodies, that's a lot of years in prison, for example. And they might be imagining that maybe this is a scenario where they've been abducted and they're gonna be dropped off. Certainly that would be going through my head because it's incredibly unusual astronomically strange for robbers to take a group of people this way and harm them. It usually is that they are taking them to a separate place to make it difficult for them to alert the officers who can bring them to justice, so to speak. So at this point, the Texas Rangers are called in. This is together with officers and local volunteers. As ever, the local community turn up. They wanna find out what's happened to people within their community. They search through the night but there is absolutely no trace of any of the missing people. And now the community, the police, and of course, more than anything, the families of those individuals who are missing are really growing concerned that something terrible might have happened. We get to the following morning, it's around 10 a.m., an oil field worker in Rusk County. Well, he spots, first of all, what he thinks are piles of dumped clothes and rubbish. It's just off a slight bend in the oil field road. But sadly, he's really mistaken. Isn't it interesting how human beings, when you see something out of character, you can kind of look at it. And we all have a spectrum of where we go with our imagination. And the idea of seeing something strange we think about potentials and for this individual it's like oh it'll just be loads of rubbish piles of clothes because it's so difficult to make the stretch that what you're about to encounter is five bodies and that's exactly what he finds on closer inspection he 
discovers the bodies of five kidnapped victims. The trauma that he must have experienced in that moment is inescapably devastating. You just cannot comprehend it, can you? He's stumbled upon an execution scene. Four of the victims, they've been lined up in a cluster. They're not far from a huge pecan tree. That's Joey, David, Monty and Mary. All of them are lying face down and their heads are resting on their arms. Some are actually covering their eyes. It's suggested by some that they weren't expecting to die, so they lay in such a way to keep the faces from the dirt. However, one could say that they were also deeply aware of what was gonna come, and they were just covering their eyes, as we do when we're children, too afraid to even imagine what is gonna befall us. So I can't tell you, body language-wise, which way that fell. Some people say the fact that they were like that is because they must have been expecting to stand up again soon. But like I said, to me, there's also that childlike quality in all of us that when we're scared, we cover our eyes. They'd been shot multiple times from behind at point blank range. Most of them had been shot mainly in the head and neck with respect. That meant that each one, as they went down the line, would listen to the person in front of them being murdered. Can you imagine being that final victim? without doubt, knowing there was no escape. They noticed that two guns had been used. There was a 357 and a 38, and three of the victims were shot with two separate revolvers. The other two victims were shot with the same weapon. And it was established that seven shots had the same rifling characteristics. Now, as revolvers only hold six bullets, that means that the likelihood is that one weapon must have actually been reloaded. Or there was a third gun involved. OP Hughes's body, well, she was discovered about 50 yards away. That was nearer to the county road. She was actually still wearing her KFC uniform and she'd been shot. But there was also sadly evidence that that poor woman had been raped. They found semen stains on the crotch of her uniform and she had defensive wounds and it indicated that of course she had put up a fight. She was brave, she was not going down without a fight. Now the fact that she was a little distance from the rest of the victims, it suggested one of two things. She was either separated so that they could sexually abuse her and that they then had some time with her before they went ahead and killed the others or they'd killed the others and then had their time with her. But there is another theory that she was with the group and realised that she was going to be executed and she understandably tried to make a run for it. And I kind of have this feeling where I'm just like, I wish they'd all just made a run for it. I wish they'd all done that. Do not comply. Just there's five of you run in different directions. I don't know, some of you are probably gonna get shot, but at least some of you may live to tell the tale. And it's likely that she did potentially make a run for it. It's also thought that Joey tried to fight back. And the reason that they believe that is he had been shot more times than the others. So Joey likely didn't go down without a fight. He probably had that sense that this is not gonna end well. So I'm going to fight. I'm going to try my best to get away from this situation. And even if I fail, know that I died fighting. So this police investigation that's gone from a robbery and a suspected abduction is now a case of mass murder. Remember what we say about mass murder? It's four or more people killed in one event. Now, the police obviously immediately launch a homicide investigation. The investigators believe that the perpetrators must have been familiar with the area because it's rather rugged terrain. So the fact they'd taken them to that place to murder them, they believe makes them suspect that they were familiar with the environment. So they launched this seven hour horseback search. They're desperately trying to find clues. They're all over the oil field where the bodies were found, but they uncovered no clues whatsoever. So now they look to the autopsies to give them information and they're all performed on the five victims on the 25th of September, 1983. And they do get 
vital forensic evidence, particularly from the bodies of OP and Joey. So at least this means that police have got something to work with. They haven't managed to get any clues on the investigation with the horses and trolling the fields, but now they do have DNA. And in addition, they've got the semen stains on Opie's clothing, which is really important. And another thing they discover is a broken fingernail trapped under Joey's waistband. So the investigation continues. The Texas Rangers at this point hand the case back to the Kilgory police and they dispatch police dogs and then they go around interviewing locals because, as we know, locals often don't realise that a piece of information that they have is incredibly important. But when the police interview them, they're able to piece together a picture that they wouldn't have seen if they hadn't had those conversations. It's often the most minute of details that seems so throwaway that breaks these cases in the end. What I will say about this particular investigation and the Rangers hanging it back to the police locally is there was a lack of funds and a lack of experience. And this means that there was also lots of procedural failures. This is so frustrating, isn't it? We're talking about five homicides, a mass murder, a brutal slaying, and money and procedural issues cause major flaws in this investigation. And it can't get more flawed than when you actually have a scenario where civilians had actually been able to enter KFC before the police had cordoned it off. Yeah, literally. I mean, I doubt that they got their chicken burgers that morning or their bucket of wings, but come on, rule one in any crime scene you tape it off, you guard it, you prevent any contamination. And that's not just because you want to protect the individuals who've been murdered from having the legacy of justice served to them by getting the right people. It also puts people who are wandering off the street completely unrelated to the crime, not getting fitted up for something that they haven't done because their DNA happens to be there. Also, the oil field crime scene wasn't secured for up to a day after the bodies were discovered. Also, the majority of the crime scene photographs were not sent off for development. Yeah. Out of 10 rolls taken, nine ended up being lost. Hi, um, yeah, are you the uh, photo forensics? Yeah, yeah, I am. Hi, I'm just wondering where all these crime scene photos are. How many have you taken? I mean, I've taken roll after roll after roll. I think I've taken like 10 rolls. Okay, it's just, um, we've opened the envelope today and there's only one roll, meaning that there's nine rolls missing. And I'm gonna be honest, some of these pictures aren't very good. They would get sent back with stickers over the overexposure on them. Okay, right. I don't know where the other nine rolls are. Okay. Okay, no problem. Happens to the best of us sends me over the edge when I have to think about things like this. It's like, this is really key information. Lives have been lost. The officers did interview Star Spagano. She's the person who overheard the phone call where they were talking about the $2,000. She also saw the black men behind her and that kind of picture of interest. She also saw the white van. So at this point, she's able to give description of the man who had stood directly behind her in the queue at KFC and who she was concerned had overheard the telephone conversation about the $2,000. So following this, the police end up questioning two young African American men. I will be honest, they were already well known to authorities. That was Darnell Hartsfield and his cousin, Romeo Pinkerton. Pinkerton had previous, he'd been in prison on at least five previous occasions. Actually, he'd only been out of prison for two days when the KFC killings occurred. And Hartsfield, meanwhile, he'd been arrested on an aggravated robbery literally just three days after the killings. They also lived in an area that matched the description given. However, I'll be honest, they were really quickly ruled out as suspects because they gave really solid alibis at that moment in time. So in spite of the fact that Star had managed to give information, it doesn't seem to turn up anything that feels solid enough to press charges.
Now bear in mind the severity of this crime. We've got five dead bodies, families ripped apart. We've got witnesses, but we also have procedural flaws and a nightmare where the crime scenes are concerned. And guess what? There's no new leads, the case goes cold. Knowing your family member has been executed in a field after they had literally gone to KFC, either to pick up their friend or because they're a member of staff who are working there, that they haven't got any justice. It's horrifying. However, there was a tiny bit of optimism, shall we say, if you can call it that, in 1995. This is 12 years after the killing, so families have had to live for 12 years not having any answers. The police speak to somebody who had been a suspect. He was the son of a statesman. Why are you bringing that in, Emma? Why would you want to bring in his father's position? Oh, I don't know. One may suggest that people in high places have quite a lot of control over the way that things pan out in the end, particularly if they're running for office. Really, Emma, I would never imagine that. I don't believe that corruption even exists in such circumstances. They're all good through and through. That's right. Of course they are. I'm sure that there's lots of evidence for that. No insider trading, for example, goes on in the government. I'm sorry, I'm going political. You know what I'm saying though, guys. At the end of the day, Nancy Polensky, I'm sure, has just got really lucky with her husband's investments. If you don't know what that's about, you can always look it up. Maybe I'll do something on that kind of crime one day. Anyway, I digress. So the police speak to this suspect. He's called Jimmy Mankins Jr. And he is actually a known criminal and he'd been convicted of federal drug trafficking charges. He'd also been overheard threatening people in town with violence, and he'd even staken claim to actually carrying out the KFC killings. It is believed by many that the reason that he went around saying that he basically executed these people in cold blood was just that he wanted to boost his street cred among drug dealers. A little bit of life advice there, Jimmy. Just gonna throw it out there. It's not good to wander around staking claim to murders that could bring you the death sentence because if you're saying it and it's verbatim, believe me, the police in the States have managed to convict people on a lot less than that. Sometimes on literally nothing. But that's what he's done. Also worth noting that they were able to say that he was in possession of a gun at the time. He'd borrowed it from somebody and it was around the time of the murders. Also, it was noted that he did have a torn fingernail at the time of the shooting, so part of his right middle fingernail had been torn off, and obviously that fitted with the scene of the crime. And Mankins had been interviewed a month after the murders, and he had, with respect, given a fingernail sample. However, in spite of that all nicely adding up, shall we say, there was actually some real problems with Mankins as a viable perpetrator, because first of all, he did not match the witness description, but when has that ever stopped the police? He looks nothing like the suspect. He looks nothing like the suspect. Not even a little bit. What if we draw a beard on him? Literally, if you drew a beard on him, it might help a little bit, but he still won't have the same color hair or eyes or height or size. Oh, you know what we should do then? What? You know how he looks nothing like him? Yeah, let's arrest him and charge him. That's what they did. So he didn't match the witness description, he gets arrested, and he gets charged with the killings in 1995. At the time, the reasoning behind that, it seems, is that they felt that the torn fingernail was a match. So he gets indicted on five counts of capital murder. But prior to the trial, because they've got the advances in DNA at this moment, it meant that the fingernail could actually be tested more accurately. And the results indicated that the fingernail found in Joey Johnson's waistband was not Mankins. It actually belonged to Mary Tyler, the KFC assistant manager, and sadly one of the victims. So the police at this point believe that they don't have anything to go on when it comes down to Mankins and they drop all the charges. Now he got released, but he had nonetheless served six months in prison at this point and clearly gone through a very public trial. We get to 2001. Now this is almost two decades after the crime. That's two decades of the family living with this loss, this frustration, this rage about their loved ones, lives that have never been lived, young men who were going to be something special to our society potentially, 
amazing workers in KFC living their lives, going through their daily motions, just trying to live happy, healthy lives, snuffed out by these violent assailants, selfishness. They were bloodlust, because that was what it was. It's been two decades. But of course, what do we know about that? Well, crimes that were committed in the 80s and 90s, even though they may think that they've got away with it, well, DNA, forensic evidence and profiling is now at such a point that even if you think you're walking free, it genuinely is a matter of time because it's getting unbelievably microscopic in detail. They can DNA things in ways that we couldn't even have imagined 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 30 years ago. So the police then review and retest the evidence and they're using all of these latest techniques. So they're able to test the victim's clothing, the stained napkin, and also the blood-stained cardboard box. So they reanalyze these. And at this point, they managed to turn up three DNA profiles. That's DNA from semen on Opie Hughes clothing, and that indicated by the way that it was from an unknown male, predominantly of African American descent. But when they look on the CODIS DNA database, which is where they store DNA that they have, and if you've committed a previous crime, it shows up, for example, his profile does not show up. So they can't link him in that way. However, DNA on a napkin and the cardboard box, well, that was a match for two men. And those two men had been questioned during the original investigation. But both of those men had been discounted at the time because they had solid alibis. That was 44-year-old Darnell Hartsfield and his cousin, 47-year-old Romeo Pinkerton. So they found Hartsfield's DNA on the cardboard box and they found Pinkerton's on the napkin. Now, these guys had known each other their whole lives. They both lived nearby in the Tyler area. So Hartsfield was actually serving a 40 year sentence for delivery of a controlled substance and engaging in organized criminal activity. And Star Spagano, who'd actually been in the restaurant with her boyfriend that night on the night of the killings, she later identified Hartsfield as the man who had been behind her in the queue at KFC. Furthermore, about a week after the murders, Hartsfield had actually been seen driving a white van, and that was a white van that was similar to the one that was seen at the KFC on the night of the killings. So obviously, that is painting a particular picture. Now we get to the 27th of November 2001, and Hartsfield goes ahead and signs a statement with the investigators, and he denies any knowledge of the killings. He claims he'd never even been to the KFC in Kilgore. So at this point, investigators take a sample of his blood. We get to 2005. This is following further investigations. Both of these men get charged with five counts of capital murder. Hartsfield at this point is also convicted of aggravated perjury because as far as they were concerned, he had lied to a grand jury in 2003 by claiming that he'd never actually been in that KFC. So ultimately, he receives a life sentence for this. Part of that is because he also had this really lengthy criminal record, but that's it, game over. As far as they're concerned, they've got him banged to rights and he will spend the rest of his life in prison. Now, throughout the investigation and the trial, both of the men said that they were completely innocent. They maintained that they had had nothing to do with the killings whatsoever. In fact, they went as far as to say they had been fitted up they said that the police had planted evidence against them, that they were the perfect suspects to present to a court. The jury would take one look at them and imagine that they potentially fitted the type of individual that they would be biased to believe would carry out such executions and robberies. Also, their previous convictions set them instead to be in a position where it was likely that a judge would go hard on them. And they say, we're innocent, but the evidence has been put in a place to make us look guilty. On the 29th of October 2007, this is during Pinkerton's actual trial, it's part way through it, he decides to actually change his plea. But 
you have to think about it from both sides. On one level, well, that makes you look guilty as hell. On the other, it potentially means that you won't be put to death because he was potentially looking at a death sentence. So then he pleads guilty to murder in exchange for five life sentences. But this is a guy who's been in the system, he's been in prison, he copes there. He probably thinks that is way preferable to being put to death. But Hartsfield refuses point blank to plead guilty. Case goes to trial in 2008. And bear in mind, this crime was notorious. And people in the local areas were very moved by what had happened to these poor people who had been executed this way. They wanted blood. And the problem is that you would have to be living under a rock, beneath a mountain, covered in carpet, to actually not have heard of what had gone on in the KFC murders. So they didn't feel that a fair trial would occur within a hundred mile radius. And that's why they move it a hundred miles out to Bowie County. This is in an attempt to find an impartial jury, if that is possible. So the prosecution, of course, they feel that they have a weight of evidence now that they can commit to showing the jury. And they allege that he had gone with his accomplices, burst into the restaurant through the back door, threatened the KFC employees and demanded money. But at this point, they decided that they didn't want any repercussions. And the only way that they could be assured of no repercussions occurring was to annihilate the actual witnesses. So at this point, their plan goes for an armed robbery and instead they drive them to this empty oil field where they rape one of them and where they execute all the others. This is a story that to some degree sounds like it could work for the jury, isn't it? It kind of fits the narrative and the prosecution seemed to have a relatively strong case in this respect. Also, a former convenience store clerk who was robbed three days after the KFC slayings, they actually gave evidence. And unfortunately for Hartsfield, or fortunately for the case, Hartsfield had actually pled guilty to that robbery. So she identifies Hartsfield as the gunman. And she said that at the time of that robbery, he had ordered her and her co-worker to lay face down on the floor. So then the prosecutors have got this perfect parallel, haven't they? Well, think about the scene of the crime in the field. All of those who had been abducted lay down with their heads on their hands in the same way that that co-worker and the individual giving evidence had been made to lie when they had been robbed. Because that's how they were found in the oil field. They were found face down. It took less than two hours deliberation. And believe me, guys, if it's less than two hours deliberation, they had made up their minds on day two. Genuinely, that's how quick a jury has decided when it only takes two hours for them to make a decision. And ultimately, they found him guilty on all counts. Interestingly, the prosecutors didn't actually choose to pursue the death penalty. Sometimes the reason that they don't decide to pursue the death penalty is even though they think they have a relatively strong case, they know that certain people on the jury situation don't feel comfortable with the death sentence. And therefore, if there is any reasonable doubt whatsoever that that person may be sent to the death chamber and they're innocent, they will arguably be a problem for making a unanimous decision and it can lead to hung juries. It can even lead to the jury effect where a very powerful juror manages to convince everybody to go not guilty because they're so moved by the potential of causing somebody to die. So the prosecutors may not have been as convinced as their case seemed to suggest they were. Now Pinkerton and Hartsfield, they both get sentenced to five and six consecutive life terms respectively. And in 2010, Hartsfield's conviction was upheld on appeal. But I'll be honest, both of the guys who were convicted of this crime have continued to proclaim their innocence. They say that they were used as stooges, that this was all a police cover-up, 
They even said that the evidence was planted. So they allege that the statesman's son, James Mankins, is the true killer. Now, what I find really disappointing about this case is we have a guy who was tried and then found guilty and then let out. We've got two guys who were in prison for life protesting their innocence. And you would imagine that if there was any information that could potentially shed light on reality of what went on, that would be chased. Because forget who did it. It's about the victim's families being given justice. It's about legacy for those individuals who lost their lives. So if there is any shred of doubt that a conviction could be unsafe, you bet your bottom dollar, you exhaust all avenues, right? So what these guys who are serving time in prison for the rest of their lives, they have tried to have a petition for the DNA evidence to be retested and it's been unsuccessful. Now, I don't get it. I appreciate, yeah, we can say, well, there's a cost associated with it. Well, good. There should be a cost associated with an investigation that's thorough. But these guys are sat rotting away in prison and they may well be guilty. I don't know. I wasn't there. There was certainly evidence that tied them to the scene, but it won't be the first time that people have been fitted up. And just because you've been a criminal in your past doesn't dictate that you deserve to go down for something that you didn't do. So if there is a chance, just a chance, a chink in the armor, that those men are not the killers, and indeed that there are others who were involved in that crime, freely walking around today, we should do everything within our power to ensure that light is shed upon it. But they won't do it. They won't retest the DNA evidence. And bear in mind, we're even further on right now in how amazing that is. I've said before in a video, they used to test 10 years ago, 15 years ago for like 14 elements. Now it's over a million. It's incredible. Also, several investigators at the crime scene following the abductions who were looking around investigating the crime scene, you know, investigating it. They were there having a gander, looking around, what can I see? They acknowledged that they never saw the napkin that linked Pinkerton to the scene. It wasn't there as far as they're concerned. And also, you know, those crime scene photos, I appreciate there weren't many because nine rolls had been lost, but who's bothered about that when two guys are in prison potentially for something they didn't do? But basically the crime scene photos didn't show its presence either. So that napkin, well, it seems to have magically appeared in evidence. And Pinkerton has stated this, the real killer is out there still walking around. I'm innocent all day long in this case. I never took anybody's life. If you look at this case, you've got two black guys. That's all that matters. And I have some sympathy and empathy with him. I really do. Genuinely. I cover a lot of cases, guys. And statistically, if you are black, particularly if you're black and you have some criminal history, some gang affiliation, you're hair in the wrong style, then you are far more likely to be sent down. I'm not saying that white guys don't go down for things that they haven't done, they do. But I do know that if you're middle class and white, you have a fairer crack at the whip of freedom when you don't deserve it. Just gonna put it out there, that's evidence statistically. So, the question is at this point, have the correct men been incarcerated? You know, Hartsfield was identified as one of the robbers and his blood was at the scene of the crime. And we know that at least two people took part in the robbery. Also, another man was seen with Hartsfield when he entered KFC. And DNA of his cousin Pinkerton was actually found in KFC. But we could also say, was it actually a police cover-up? Was it a police cover-up to protect the son of a statesman? And no doubt, the statesman political career and reputation. Wouldn't be the first time, would it? Because the evidence suggests that the thing about this offence that we're talking about today is it could not, when you just consider all conceivable ways of it being played out, it could not have been carried out by one person alone. It's just so unlikely that a single person could abduct and could murder five people. This included three strong young men.
So the suspect is there is at least one other man involved. And eyewitness testimony, well, that also suggests that that was the case because, you know, people have put more than one person at the scene of the crime. Also, bear in mind that four of the victims had to be subdued whilst Mary was sexually assaulted. So the forensic evidence indicates that at least two perpetrators participated in the killings. And at least two different guns were used to kill the victims, although the number of gunshot wounds suggested, in fact, that actually a third gun may also have been involved. So there could have even been a third shooter. And furthermore, there's that semen stain, that semen stain that was found from another as yet unidentified male. To date, this third perpetrator has not been found. Now, this case remains open and the controversy continues. And the worst bit about that, guys, is that it means that the families of these victims, they haven't truly been afforded the peace they deserve. Because if there is even a possibility that somebody who sexually assaulted and raped this poor woman and then killed her, executed her, along with four other individuals, is still walking the streets, what does that say? about the system and I can't answer the question are the right people in prison let me know let me know your thoughts on the KFC murders it's one of the most horrific mass killings I've read about so extraordinarily strange that somebody can just be going to pick up a friend from work or working in a takeaway and suddenly find themselves in a horror scene something out of their darkest nightmares playing out before their eyes, executing them in an oil field. How could any of them imagine that an ordinary everyday night could turn into such a bloodbath? Let me know what you thought of this case. If you've enjoyed my content, give me a like, subscribe if you want to hear more. I release my content on a Wednesday and a Sunday. I would love to have you here. Thank you so much for joining me. And I just hope that in the end, we really get to learn the truth about this case. Give me some information if you've got it and I haven't talked about it today. I appreciate every single comment that I get. Take care, be safe.